Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Celeste Wooten. Um, as Matt said, I am the secretary for the board of directors. I am also a hospice CNA of 21 years this year, makes 21 years. Um, I have a passion for helping others um, that's been instilled in me and um, I'm, I'm grateful for that gift, but I also have a passion to mentor and um, to uplift other CNAs, what, no matter where they work, where there's a hospital, nursing home, assisted living, um, hospice like I do, home health, anywhere that I can be of service to others, I want to do that. So that's a little bit about me. That's fantastic. I'm Lisa Sweet. I am a registered nurse, but I started out Let's see, gosh, that's a lot of math. Over 30 years ago as a nursing assistant and um, I worked as a nursing assistant and then I went to LPN school and I was on the 10 year program with the college thing. So I did prerequisites and I eventually became a registered nurse. All of my nursing career has primarily been with elderly people. Um, Old folks are my passion. I was a little kid in the neighborhood that rode my bike to all the little old ladies' homes and helped them pull the weeds out of their garden and things like that. So um, I am passionate about old folks and CNAs. Um, so I am excited to be here and to address this topic, important topic of self-care for CNAs. And I was very fortunate when I was looking at doing this webinar, I knew I wanted to include somebody from the board and I immediately thought of Celeste and she actually has presented this webinar before and she pretty much, she developed the content, had already had the content developed and um, we kind of rebranded it. And so thank you Celeste for sharing this with us. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, without further ado, um, we will go ahead and get into it. I know you have a PowerPoint, so let me bring that up now. Okay. And again, this is uh, the webinar, Caring for the Caregiver, the Importance for Self-Care for CNAs, um, which is hosted by the National Association of Healthcare Assistants. And again, with our presenters, Celeste Wooten, uh, Secretary on the NACA Board of Directors, and Lisa Sweet, Chief Clinical Officer at NACA. So guys, go ahead and take it away. All right, we'll, we'll let you go to the next slide. And so the, the over, overview for this course, this webinar um, is that we're going to discuss self-care, what self-care is, how it's defined, why it's so important. We hear the term self-care tossed around all the time. We're gonna talk about why it's important, especially for CNAs and why CNAs tend to neglect self-care and actual ways to improve one's self-care and activities. Next slide. So what exactly is self-care? Um, I could have came up with so many definitions, but I kind of wanted to find out what the actual technical definition of self-care was. So according to the World Health Organization, or as we know, WHO, um, self-care is defined as what people do for themselves to establish and maintain health and to prevent and deal with illness. Self-care is a skill. It is a skill that many CNAs neglect to develop. Um, and I will even go so far as say, Self-care is a skill that some of our companies fail to incorporate as a learned skill amongst coworkers and employees, because sometimes self-care is taught, it should be put on the back burner because we have to take care of others. Next slide, please. That's such a good point, Celeste, that oftentimes employers encourage us to put ourselves on the back burners and our employers actually um, encourage us to neglect ourselves to great degree. Um, that is an excellent point, but um, 
as you said, we need to take responsibility for our own self-care. So why is self-care so important? Uh, Celeste had this on her presentation and I think it's one of my favorite sentences in this whole presentation. You can't pour from an empty cup. In order to do our jobs effectively, we have to take care of ourselves. If your cup is empty, you are not going to have the physical, mental, or emotional strength to do the important work that you do. The work of a CNA is one that, unlike so many other um, professions, the work of a CNA is one that is physically taxing because you're using your body to move other people. Um, it's emotionally taxing because you're dealing with illness, disease, and death. And it can be mentally taxing because oftentimes we're working with residents who have Alzheimer's and dementia, and they can ask the same questions repeatedly, as you all know. And so it can really, really be um, almost an assault to our bodies um, when we're at work. And so that makes self-care for CNAs so much more important than the clerk at the convenience store. Now everybody needs self-care, but right. in my opinion, self-care for CNAs is so necessary. And so remember, you can't pour from an empty cup. Next slide. So some of the things that CNAs experience, and I can go through this whole list and check, 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 check all the way down. Um, we experience physical exhaustion. Being a CNA is physically exhausting. It is exhausting on your back. It is exhausting on your arms and your legs. You're lifting, you're moving, you're pulling. So physically, it is exhausting. Um, Emotional exhaustion, that is a big one because you spend all day long, the whole time you're on your shift, you are emotionally spending all day long because you're caring for other people's needs. Not even so much the residents' needs, you're caring for coworkers' needs, you're caring for bosses' needs. You know, you're getting probably text messages on the phone from your family while you're trying to give needs. So you're just emotionally spending all day long. And by the end of that shift or the end of your day, you're just spent. Um, burnout. Um, this is something that I see a lot of happening now, especially after the crisis that we have experienced with this pandemic. A lot of CNAs have just truly burnt out. They have worked and worked and worked to the point where they have said, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't, I don't even know why I want to do this anymore. Um, and when you start losing your why, that is your alert that you are burning out. Um, moral distress. It's, it's just, you get to that point where it's just like, whatever. If I get the job done, I get it done. If I don't, I don't. And, and, you just lose the focus of why you're there and you lose the um, ability to say, hey, I'm here to do such and such and such and I'm here for a reason. But after you get the physical exhaustion, the emotional exhaustion and you get to the burnout, everything just kind of comes to a halt and you just, I don't care. Um, compassion fatigue. I know this personally because of, like I said, I'm in hospice. And you do experience it. it, everybody experiences it no matter where you work, but I know I can speak from my personal um, point of view with the compassion fatigue because of the families I deal with, the situations I deal with, the different family dynamics. Um, and then you have everybody that's on the team. And so everybody's kind of dealing with the situation. So you're caring and caring and caring and caring to where it's almost like your compassion kind of runs out because you've gave all that care away. Um, and it's not a bad thing, but you have to learn to balance it. Um, you give care on your job, 
but you kind of got to balance it out and keep some for you. Um, repeated workplace stressors and stressors are at home. Um, they kind of go hand in hand because with the repeated workplace stressors, you take those stressors home with you. Then you have the work, the home stressors that's happening and you end up taking it to work with you. So they kind of intertwine. Um, with the repeated workplace stressors, it's, it, there's stressors every day. Um, some, you know, somebody doesn't show up for work or somebody needs you to stay over for overtime and you really don't feel like it. Um, or somebody didn't get a shower earlier in the day and you come in on three to 11 and they're telling you, you got to give a shower on top of everything else you got to do. Um, and then at home, you know, the bills are piling up, uh, <laughs> you know, the kids are running crazy. So all that intertwines and you have all that stress and it builds up. And sometimes it's hard to separate the two and they just kind of clash and run together. So we as CNAs experience all of this. Next slide, please. I just want to add a little bit on to what Celeste said. Um, you were talking about the home stressors. And um, I think that this past year, this has mm -hmm. probably been the most challenging for CNAs, regardless of the setting that you work in, because yeah. CNAs with children, their children were doing school from home. Mm -hmm. And so that added an additional stress of childcare and trying to make certain they were doing their online classes. And meanwhile, many CNAs had to take a couple of weeks off because they became infected with COVID. Um, the moral distress to me is very um, powerful. That's a powerful term. Um, I heard a speaker who talked about moral distress and um, gave an example of a CNA whose home um, was experiencing a COVID outbreak and many of the residents were very, very seriously ill. And they were short staffed, short of what they were scheduled, were definitely short of what they wanted to work with CNA wise. And the CNA had several residents who were very, very ill and actively dying. And she was trying to figure out where to spend her time, whose hand did she, did she need to hold? They all deserved it. She wanted to be there for all of them. And that creates moral distress. And as caregivers, as CNAs, it's so difficult. I, I can only imagine that when you're driving home at the end of your shift, you are probably still thinking about, you know, the fresh water that you didn't deliver to this resident mm -hmm. or the fact that you didn't get get to give some extra conversation and one-on-one -on -one time to this resident. And so that moral distress will really, really um, impact you in a negative way. Um, and so I'm so glad you brought those, those points up, Celeste. So why is self-care neglected? CNAs give of themselves so much at work. We've talked about physically, emotionally, mentally. Um, that when they do get the precious time off work, they prioritize what they have to do with that time. And they usually put themselves on the bottom of that priority list. Things that go above on the priority list are things like taking care of children or children's sporting events or taking care of parents. So a lot of CNAs are in that sandwich generation right now. And they're taking care of children and they're taking care of parents who are aging or, or they have an illness or disease that requires some additional care. And so they, those CNAs have lots of priorities and they usually put themselves at the bottom. Mm -hmm. CNAs so often say, I will do that for myself next week. Yet that time gets consumed by something else. Next week never comes, right? Um, CNAs make others the priority instead of themselves. I think that part of that comes from, and Celeste, chime in if you agree or disagree. I'm um, <laughs> Yeah. 
Yes, yes. <laughs> I think that CNAs, by nature of their characteristics, okay, most career CNAs have certain characteristics that make them perfect for their positions as caregivers. They're compassionate, they're dedicated, they are generous, they are caring, they're patient. But many times those same characteristics that make them a great CNA also are the same characteristics that make them neglect themselves and their own self-care because they are so compassionate they can't say no to working that Saturday off that they were so desperately looking forward to because they are so dedicated. They agree to come in at 4 a.m. because night shift is short and they want to get, they need to relieve um, somebody who worked over from evening shift. Mm -hmm. And so it's those very traits that make them create CNAs that also make them make you all um, kind of neglect yourselves. And I think Celeste brought up a wonderful point earlier when she said, oftentimes our employers encourage that. And I have seen employers who not only encourage it, but they expect it. If you work in certain positions, for example, um, veterans homes, veterans home CNAs are subject to mandation which means that if you're on day shift and you're getting ready to clock out and the scheduler tells you, and the scheduler's office is probably right by the time clock, the scheduler tells you that two people didn't show up for evening shift and your, your number's up for mandation, you have to stay over if you want to keep your job. And so those kinds of things is, when employers are actually encouraging us to neglect ourselves. And so I know that it's important for people to work overtime. Some people are dependent upon it financially. Some people have to work two jobs to make ends meet, or they have to work a certain number of hours of predicted overtime. Um, and so I know that some people have to do that financially, but I do think that sometimes our employers take advantage of our generosity and our compassion and the fact that we know that if we don't stay over, there's going to be some residents who aren't going to get the care that they need and deserve. And so I'm not certain what the answer is from the employer side because they're Try, they're trying to cover their bases. Um, one of the answers is that we need, we desperately need more CNAs in this country. We need more people to join us in the work that we do. And that would go a long way toward allowing us a little bit more time to give ourselves some self care. Next slide. So when self-care is neglected, aches and pains throughout the body can happen. And I know this to be true because self-care neglect makes you physically ill, makes you sick because it's your body's way of saying, hello, I need some care. And so it will start to ache. You will start to hurt. Um, it can also lead to depression. In the depression, it can um, start to make you feel like you're not worth anything. Um, it can make you start to feel just really low because you're not taking care of yourself. You get to where you almost start loathing to go to work. Um, you get to where you're like, oh, I got to go to my job again today. And, you're free, and you forget about your reason why you have that job. Um, it can cause low blood sugar. And, and that is true like with CNAs because we rip and we run and we're going here, we're going there. And, you know, we might grab, you know, a, maybe a glass of water, maybe, um, or maybe a cracker or two <laughs> if you've got time. 
um, and it causes your blood sugar to plummet. I've actually seen it happen where a young lady who she was going throughout her day, and I mean, she literally had not eaten in almost 12 hours and passed out on the floor. And it was because her blood sugar was um, really, really low. It can also cause high blood pressure. Because you are so stressed out and you're trying to take care of everybody, make sure everything is done, make sure every resident is clean and, and good to go and, and making sure your charting's done and make sure you reported off things. Sometimes it can have the, the, the effect of it will stress you out and it will run your blood pressure through the roof. Um, and it, that, that's, 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 again, that is a sign that you've got to slow down a little bit. Um, you have to because you are just as important as those residents and any other employee that's in your building. So you got to make sure and be mindful of you. Um, a low immune system or resistance. When you're stressed out, when you're not taking care of yourself, you set yourself up to get colds. Um, you will catch anything that is going around, um, you know, because your immune system is just is shocked because you're just you're tired, you're overwhelmed, you're stressed out. So it has a negative effect on that um, and chronic fatigue. Um, there's a thing of being tired. And then there's a thing of being fatigued, low down, tired, everything hurts, everything aches, everything from your mind on down, everything. You are just tired. Um, so these symptoms can be dangerous, especially during patient care, because it could lead to a patient falling. It could lead to you missing work. And if you're not if you're not caring from yourself for yourself, other health health issues, it's going to happen. It's guaranteed. It's going to happen. Um, it is especially important to keep self care as a daily part of your routine, no matter how big or small the care is, as long as it is something for you. Um, I always encourage my team that I work with. In between our travels to our patients, because we travel, I say pull off somewhere. If you find a little park or you find a little empty parking lot, pull off somewhere and give yourself 10, 15 minutes if you can. And, you know, have that little cracker and something to drink. Something in your day for you. Yes, we have a job to do. Yes, we do. But we also have to make sure that as we approach each of our patients and as you approach your residents, that you are ready to take on whatever is happening with them. And if you are stressed out, flustered, tired, you know, hangry, as some people call it because you're hungry and you're tired, you can't really deal and give your resident or your patient your 100%. And unfortunately, that's what we have to give to everybody. We have to give everybody almost 100%. And we want to make sure that we're 100% for safety reasons for them, 100% for safety reasons for our own selves, and 100% to make sure that we are taking care of us, no matter what that little bit of something to do is, you know, what size that is. Next slide, please. Um, just to uh, reflect a little bit on what Celeste said, I ha there was a situation that um, really changed my perspective on a lot of things. I was a nursing director at a skilled nursing facility and had an awesome team of CNAs. <clears throat> there was a CNA that worked day shift, I'm going to call her Erin, and she worked full-time day shift and she worked part-time evening shift at another job, as so many CNAs do. And um, Christmas Eve, she worked day shift at, this at the facility I was at. And she was also scheduled to work Christmas Day. That was her choosing. And 
she worked Christmas Eve evening at her other job. I'd been noticing that she had been looking really tired and I kind of talked to her, aren't you ready to give that second job up? And she's like, oh, I gotta pay my car off. And <laughs> so Christmas morning rolls around and you know, she had worked essentially a double shift the day before. Christmas morning rolled around and bright and early, I think it was about 6.30 because the shift, day shift started at 6 a.m. Um, the nurse called me, the nurse supervisor, and she said, hey, Erin didn't show up for work. I told you that we weren't going to be able to count on her. And I bet you she got offered a bunch of money to work at her other job today. And they were all trying to call the other job to see if Erin was there. And I'm like, no, you know, Erin wouldn't do that to us. And, mm -hmm. and so as it turns out, Erin lived in another little nearby town. Erin um, was on her way to work that morning and about 5.30 in the morning, she, was, she hit a patch of black ice and was killed in a car accident. Um, and so I don't know that her level of alertness was impacted by the fact that she probably worked until after midnight the night before and was operating on very little sleep. Um, we assume that it was a patch of black ice. She may have fallen asleep at the wheel, which kind of is what I thought because she drove a vehicle that, um, isn't one that tends to slide easily on ice. And so um, those kinds of things can be life altering. Everything that Celeste just spoke of can be life altering and um, a young CNA lost her life. So it uh, is very important, yes, to take some, take time for yourself and to watch the, uh, the fatigue. Um, essentially, there are eight areas of self-care, and those are mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, social, personal, professional, and medical. And self-care is broken up into those areas um, so that we can focus on various, those, those various um, pieces of our life, and as Celeste described earlier, so that we can maintain some balance in our lives. You know, I kind of look at things like, a, look at our lives like a tripod. And if one of those legs of the tripod is shorter than the others, you're gonna have a cattywampus tripod. And so um, everything has to be within balance to keep everything stable and going smoothly. Next slide, please, Matt. So mental self-care includes taking time to expand or gain knowledge outside of healthcare and strengthen your confidence. And I can attest to this for the very longest. I wanted to read anything and everything that has to do about hospice and Alzheimer's and death and dying. I've got a collection going, but then I stopped enjoying and, and, uh, being involved in other stuff. Um, I'm a big cookbook fan. I love to read cookbooks. I may not cook all that stuff, but I love to read cookbooks. Um, I love to read uh, plant, you know, books about gardening. I love, you know, just different stuff like that. And I had to learn that I have to start doing other stuff other than the medical things that I was doing. So I broke it down into work life and home life. So with work life, I said, engage into a committee. Um, you know, if you guys are able to do committees at your job, you can do the, you know, new, new employee committee or, you know, the clean up the nurses day, any kind of committee that you could be on to, to do something different. Um, completing a CEU course, um, you know, because that has to do with what you're doing at work. So, you know, that would be your work life. But at home, you could try a brand new hobby. Um, you know, this year, I really got into the outside and the gardening thing. I never was into that. But this year, I became addicted to it now. And I, that's my downtime. 
um, reading a new book or joining a book club, um, listening to podcasts and audiobooks. That was another thing that I really started doing this year was listening to the audiobooks and podcasts of different things. Um, and then start a, a self journal. Um, I'm not a big writer. So what I've learned to do is, and it's crazy as it may sound, I've made recordings of myself saying basically what I would write in a journal. And I've, I've made the recordings of me saying it out loud. I'm more of a, as you can probably tell, I'm more of a person that can talk to you and tell you how I feel or, or tell you about something versus writing it down. I'm not very good with writing stuff on paper. I'm very good at expressing it and telling you from me. But it's, it's something that needs to be done because, again, when you're at work, you're at work. You have to learn to di differentiate between the two and make sure that, again, your work life is not colliding with your home life. So, um, you know, those are just a few ideas that you could possibly do when you're learning to uh, avoid that collision with the mental self-health care. Next slide, please. You know, Celeste, I think with the with the past year and all of the struggles that CNAs have had, um, especially in nursing homes with the PPE shortage, the CNA shortage, mm -hmm. COVID, the threat of taking it home to their families, um, losing so many residents and the death every day. I think mm -hmm. that that really... Um, is very timely self care for one's mental health because I think that I think that we have a whole group of CNAs out there. I think there's a whole bunch of CNAs who have experienced trauma this past year, mm -hmm. and I don't think anybody's addressing that. Now we do have another webinar coming up the first week in June, and it's going to be on the mental health especially the mental health portion of self-care. And I hope that many of you uh, tune in to that and watch that because mental health is something that's very important to me. May is mental health month. Men needing, needing support, ensuring your mental health or experiencing mental unwellness or mental health problems, that's not a crime. That's right. not a sign of weakness. That's right. Yes. One of the strongest things you can do is know when to seek support and ask for help. And after this past year, it is so understandable that any of you, that all of you could need support and help after what you have witnessed, a, his, a historic pandemic of, of enormous proportions. And you were directly, not only in the line of fire, but you were the support for the people who were the most vulnerable and the most impacted, and that's nursing home residents. And so don't neglect your mental health care um, on our next webinar. Well, not the very next webinar, but the webinar in June, we're gonna talk about some mental health resources that are free, that are anonymous, and that I think could help everyone so much. And so that was a, that was a, a great way to describe that, Celeste. Um, physical self-care, is, and is just as important as mental self-care. And this should include activities that work all major muscle groups. Now, I know what everybody's saying. You just come and follow me at work. I walk 10 miles every day up and down those halls and deliver on ice. And well, yes, you do walk a lot at work. And you use a lot of muscles at work. But that doesn't count. Your, your physical activity at work doesn't count toward physical self-care because, uh, because you're in a work environment at the time. And, and so physical self-care needs to include exercise that works all of your major, major muscle groups and in your off time. So there's some ways to do that in your work life. 
park far away from the building if it's safe and and if it's at night make sure it's well lighted and things like that and and walk when i go to the grocery store i make myself park real far away and i walk usually when i'm pushing my grocery cart back to the car it's uphill and i'm thinking why the heck did i not go for the closest parking space because i'm out of breath and huffing and puffing but I know that that's the best thing for me because that's going to force me to do that physical activity. Use the stairs instead of the elevator. Bring your own healthy lunch and snacks. Avoid takeout and avoid going to the cafeteria or vending machines. I worked the intensive care unit for a couple of years and it was mostly geriatric patients that we had in the intensive care unit. And I very much loved being able to deliver one-on-one -on -one care and do everything from bed baths to uh, cardiac outputs through a, a Swan, Swanscan's catheter. Um, but one thing that working in the intensive care unit did to me was made me hate hot food because we would often order out and the food would be delivered and we would be busy. And so my food was always cold. It was usually an hour and a half, two hours before I managed to get to the break room to eat my food that had been sitting there. And so I got accustomed to eating um, room temperature food. And to this day, I have a hard time sitting down to a hot plate of food. I usually have to visit with whoever I'm with or, or read my phone or something like that to let my food cool down just because just for that reason but do bring your own healthy snacks avoid the vending machines avoid the soda machines now i know what you all are thinking because i've been sitting here i promise i do not own stock in coca-cola and i'm not advertising for them i'm kind of addicted to diet coke i do make myself drink water and it throws my kidneys into shock every time i do um but uh, I would like to say that those vending machines with soda pop look very appealing, but caffeine is a urinary stimulant irritant, and it's going to make you have to go to the bathroom more, and it's a diuretic, and it can actually dehydrate you. And I know that sounds weird because you're putting fluid into your body, but you're going to be putting, you're going to be peeing more into the toilet and you're going to become dehydrated because that's how caffeine, especially soda pop works. And so avoid those vending machines if at all possible. Um, so your home life, find exercises that you enjoy. Do those exercises with your significant other or your pet. That would work. Uh, take a power nap. I'm all for that. I'm a napper. A 20 minute nap can do wonders for your body and for your mental clarity. Now I'm not saying that in the middle of a work shift, go back and take a 20 minute nap. That probably wouldn't work. Your, the nurses would get all overs for that. But at home, if you're tired, take a 20 minute nap. When you get home from work, if you have an opportunity, take a 20 minute nap. They say naps are so beneficial to our brains because it's only when we sleep that our brains kind of calm down. Now your brain doesn't shut off when we sleep or we wouldn't, our hearts wouldn't beat and we wouldn't be breathing. So our brains can't shut off, but our brains are able to really um, get some rest when we're sleeping. So a nap would definitely help. Schedule a massage and enjoy the benefits. It is amazing. And as Celeste said, work in your garden. That's always a great thing, but you need to do some physical activity and you need to take care of your physical body. Next slide. So next we're going to talk about emotional self-care. At your work life, you can have conversations that include humor because everybody always says laughing is good for the soul. And I do a lot of laughing. My patients kind of laugh at me. They're just like, you're silly. I'm like, I just, it's good for you. <laughs> um, go outside on your breaks and enjoy a little fresh air and sunshine. You know, it, it 
does a, a good thing for you. Um, in your home life, be creative, build something or make something. Let yourself sit still, unwind and allow yourself to laugh, cry and feel your emotions. Call your friends. You can always call somebody and just, you know, have that venting session. Um, look at yourself in the mirror and speak words of affirmation. And I have those all over my mirror and I have them at my job as well. Um, and speak them to yourself and mean them. Um, you know, because sometimes you can't wait on others to encourage you. You have to encourage yourself first. Next slide. So spiritual care, whether it's religious in nature or not, can be a component of self-care. Spiritual care really doesn't have anything to do with religion. If you're a religious person and you have a faith and you go to church, that's fantastic. That can be a really great source of support, encouragement, and motivation. Um, if you don't, spirituality can still be a very important part of your life that will contribute to your self-care. In your work life, you need to respect and try to understand both patients and coworkers' beliefs. You know, we're working in buildings with a lot of people, both residents and other staff, and they're not all gonna believe like you do, but we need to be respectful of the beliefs of others. Advocate for patients who want a chaplain to come visit with them. If there's not one ready available, see the social worker or find someone who can get a chaplain in to see that patient. And again, go outside or at least near a window and become mindful with meditation and just really appreciate the magnificence of nature. And that can, um, can really help. Even if you're going out on your break for 10 minutes, it can really kind of freshen your body and freshen your mind for the remainder of your shift. Your home life, learn yoga. There's all kinds of free apps and things that can, that can teach you that. Declutter your home and your mind. Unplug from social media and television. And sometimes you just have to turn your phone off. Put it away. Don't look at it. Don't get all caught up in Facebook or anything like that. Just give yourself some quiet time. Keep a gratitude journal. List out things you're grateful for. I think you'll find that you have a lot more than what you realize. And meditation can always be very helpful. Next slide, please. So social self-care. Humans are very social creatures. Connection to others is very important. Um, so at work, have lunch with somebody. Um, just today, my administrator came in and pulled up a chair and said, I'm going to have lunch with you. Okay. <laughs> you know, and she was just like, I just wanted to come in and have lunch with you. And we sat and we just talked, you know, we didn't talk about the job. We talked about, you know, her family. We talked about my grandkids and my family. So it was just an interaction kind of talking, but that happened at work. Um, ask your coworkers how their day is going. I'm quick to send one of my team members a text message talking about, hey, beautiful, hope you're having a great day. You know, let me know if you need anything. And they'll text me and they'll say, what's wrong? And I'm like, nothing. I'm just checking in on you, you know, because people are not used to other people doing that. So, you know, just ask your coworkers how their day is going. Just say, I just wanted to check on you and see how things were. Now, when you go home, plan a date night with your spouse or significant other and no talking about work. I am guilty about this. Sometimes my date nights <laughs> turn into me talking about something about work, but I do it unintentionally. And that is something I'm learning not to do. Um, call a loved one. Um, I going to say this, that with the way things are going nowadays, speak to your loved ones often, more often than not. Um, you don't want to have that feeling of, I should have called so-and-so. I should have said what I had to say. You know, it would have took two seconds. 
or you know however long just just don't wait um have a game night with your family um we play a lot of uno in this house and i am the champion <laughs> you know um plan a girls night or guys night um just just basically have your home life um do things with your loved ones S again separate yourself from work and when you're at home you're at home and you're doing home things and that is your home self-care next slide please so personal self-care includes cultivating interest and an identity outside of your work as a cna outside of healthcare. This can really help you feel more fulfilled and give you that needed respite from work. And we all need that. So try some of these ideas. Participate in a new hobby, baking, crafting, gardening. Um, add some adventure with hiking or canoeing. Then you get your physical activity in as well. Uh, have a me day complete with uh, hairstyle, manicure, pedicure, and a nice dinner for one. That's cool. And only commit you or your family to activities that you can manage. In other words, don't overextend yourself. Don't, you don't have to accept every invitation that you receive. And so accept the ones that really mean something to you. And if it's something that you really don't want to do, there's nothing that says that you have to do that social engagement. And so don't overextend yourself. Do something that has absolutely nothing to do with healthcare. Next slide. So professional self-care, which is keeping your professional life organized can help you stay sane. So during these uncertain times that we're still in, we want to make sure that we are careful and focused as to protect ourselves as well as those we care for every day. So here are some ways to stay on track. Declutter your work bag. Our work bags fill up with wipes and, and sanitizers and keys and notebooks and everything. Wipe, take all that stuff out, wipe everything down, declutter it down and get it to just what you really need. Um, making sure your attire is put together and present yourself professionally. I know um, sometimes when Lori is talking to us, she tells us about, you know, when uniforms were pressed and they wore the white and, you know, they, ca they came in there ready to go. You know, and I'm like that now with some of my scrubs and stuff. I like my scrubs to look neat. I like to present myself as professional. I don't want to go in and, you know, my hair is 12 different colors and, you know, my uniform looks all crazy. And I'm, you know, to me, I want to look professional because I want my patient to know that they are getting professional care. Um, create career goals. Again, not every CNA wants to be a nurse. But there are other avenues that CNAs can take, other things that they can do. They can establish on to what they already are doing by taking the extra classes. So when you have clocked out, make sure you have truly clocked out. I am leaving. When I step out this door, I have clocked out. Do not call your coworkers to see what's going on after you've left. Do not accept text messages when people are telling you, you know, everything is going crazy now and we don't have enough stat. When you step out, you've clocked out. That is a very hard lesson to learn, but a very necessary lesson to learn. Next slide. Medical self-care. Healthcare workers know that medical self-care is important for patients, but what about ourselves? You know, we really tend to neglect ourselves in that area. So let's focus on daily physical activity. So like an extra 15 minute walk before or after work or even both. Healthy food and drink choices, healthy weight management, uh, routine preventive care, this includes things like mammograms, 
And if you all are thinking, I don't have the money for a mammogram, there are all kinds of free programs out there where you can get a mammogram at no cost. And that is part of self-care. Dental care is part of self-care. And that's one thing that I am very neglectful of is my dental care. Um, I tend to grind my teeth at night. And so um, I need lots of dental work right now. And I was able to put it off while COVID was going on because I didn't want to go to the dentist and have somebody in my face. And so now that COVID is starting to tamper down and they are adjusting the mask requirements. I don't really have an excuse and I'm gonna to have to go to the dentist, but don't forget about um, those kinds of preventive cares. Colonoscopies, they recommend colonoscopy, colonoscopies for people, I think at age 55 maybe, earlier, if you've had any kind of symptoms, but that's another uh, preventive care type medical issue that's recommended. Quality sleep, I cannot stress enough that quality sleep is, is so important regardless of what shift you work. You may be trying to sleep in the daytime. Do what you have to do to ensure yourself quality sleep. If you have to put a note on the door that says, if you ring my doorbell or knock on my door, I'm gonna come out and kill you. You probably won't have too many people knocking on your door. Now don't really put that, but you can put a strongly worded message that doesn't threaten death and people will probably leave you alone. And then finding ways to manage your stress. Work stress will eat you alive. And part of the, one of the best ways of managing that stress is exactly as Celeste said, and that is when you step out of that building, you're clocked out and that will help you manage that stress. Next slide, Matt please. So here are some examples of a selfless gifts for self-care. Buying some new shoes complete with compression socks because those hardworking legs deserve it. Mm. Buy some fresh flowers to help brighten your mood. Um, I suggest that all the time. I mean, there's nothing wrong with buying yourself flowers. Nothing wrong at all. It brightens your mood. It kind of lifts up your spirits, um, order a meal kit service if you're able to do that. And you don't have to stay on the service. There's some that you can just order for like a week at a time to give yourself a break from having to come home and cook or to prepare your lunch for the next day or something to treat yourself to something like that. Um, buy your favorite coffee or smoothie, turn on some relaxing music and just enjoy the moment. Um, light a candle and take a relaxing bubble bath. All these suggestions are what you deserve. You just gotta realize you deserve it and you gotta make it happen. Next slide, please. Please remember to show up for yourself. Self-care is so very important, even in a pandemic, even in a CNA shortage, it is important. Again, you cannot pour from an empty cup and you cannot give to others what you cannot give to yourself. Self-care is not selfish. And so many of us have been told that, that we need to be strong and stoic and toughen up and, and there's nothing strong about that. Being strong is knowing your limitations and taking care of yourself so that you will be able to take care of the residents the next day. Next slide, Matt. And so I think we have just a couple of questions um, in the Q&A. Um, Matt, do you want to give those to us or do you want me to? Yeah, that, that would be great. Um, before we get to those questions, I did want to um, let everybody know about the webinars that we are having coming up um, just shortly. And then we'll get to that QA real quick. Um, but let me get this going here. So the, the, the part two, the follow-up to this webinar um, is going to be with Lisa Sweet again um, and another member of our board, Sheena Bumpus. 
Uh, she's actually the vice chair of the NACA board of directors. And that'll be on June 1st um, at the same time of day that this one was. So um, basically just a, a couple weeks from now um, is whenever that webinar is. And then I would also like to let you guys know about um, Lori will be going live on Thursday on the NACA Facebook page, which some of you are watching on right now. Um, you just tune into that. You can even uh, sign up for the event, I believe, and it'll push a notification to you. Those will be every two weeks. And then on the alternating weeks, uh, Dane Henning uh, does his uh, advocacy uh, Facebook lives. And then we have our next uh, board of directors webinar. Uh, Celeste was the one who kicked us off with that, actually. Um, but this will be with Brandon Philbrook. He is uh, one of our newest NACA board members, but he's really focusing on entering uh, the world of people living with dementia. Um, and so that's a 30 minute webinar. It's on May 27th at 3 p.m. Central. You can find the links to register for that on the webpage or in the emails that we send out. It'll also be going to Facebook Live. And then I also just want to draw everybody's attention to the big week that is coming up that we need to make sure I mean, not you CNAs out there, but everybody else who's listening, find a CNA, let them know how much they mean to you and appreciate them from June 17th. I mean, every day, but specifically June 17th to the 24th. That is CNA week this year. And this, this year, it better be lit. No more pizza parties. We want good stuff, right? That's right. We, des we deserve it. CNAs so deserve it. Thank you for letting me uh, take a quick opportunity to promo some of the upcoming events we had. And I think we just have time for one question here, um, but it's one that we've gotten from a couple different places. And that is, um, if you notice that a coworker is showing burnout or they're extremely stressed about work, should you reach out to them or should you let it resolve itself? And then follow up to that, how do we approach them? You know, if you let it resolve itself, that person is probably going to quit or get fired, mm -hmm. get fired for, for absenteeism or something. When you're suffering burnout, you're not real reliable um, and you're very impatient and you're sometimes you're kind of angry. And so I think that as CNAs, we have a responsibility to help look out for our coworkers. And if you notice somebody's burnout, I think that I'll let Celeste answer for herself. But in my opinion, I think approaching that person and just saying, hey, I am a little bit concerned about you. You, you, you seem like you're a little bit more stressed and you know, just identify what you're seeing that's making you think that person is burnt out. And if they do confide in you that they're struggling or having some issues or they're feeling burnout, discuss some things that they can do. Do they need to, to request a few days off? Because as a former director of nurses, I would much rather schedule a person a few days off to help with that burnout than to lose that person entirely. And so I think we have an obligation to our coworkers and the residents to address that if we think that's occurring. Celeste? I agree. I mean, um, I've had coworkers where I've noticed it and I'll just, you know, walk up and say, hey, you doing all right? Can I do anything? Um, is everything OK? Can I help you? And you will get them to answer you back and you will you'll start to know something is up. And I mean, I've even so much as offered to go to our director of nursing with that person to see what it is I can do to help because I don't want them to feel like I'm tattling and I don't want them to feel like they're alone. Thank Good you guys point. so much. And I, I do just want to dig a little bit deeper into that because I imagine there are people out there saying, well, what if I get hostility whenever I try to approach somebody to help them? What if I get hostility back from them? You know, that's always a chance. Um, people who are burnt out are kind of on the defensive sometimes. And so you just got to be strong and be prepared to take the hostility if they do come back with that. And, and you have to know that that hostility is not directed at you. We never know what's going on in people's personal lives, what they're dealing with at home. And so um, realize that that hostility is not directed at you. You've done what you can, what you're able to do to help that person. 
and some people may not be responsive responsive to your offer of support and assistance um, but do not let that discourage you from offering to help people in the future Great. Thank you guys so much. And thank you everybody who is watching us um, on Zoom, who registered for the Zoom and was watching with us. And those of you who are joining us on Facebook Live, please stay tuned for uh, these webinars. Again, the next one coming up on June 1st. Just um, keep uh, eyes on our Facebook page or our emails that we send out and you can, you can register to attend those in the future. And uh, with that, we will sign off. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Celeste. Thank you. Thank you.